All right, so this is the Unit 5 practice test or kind of uh, review for the test for Bio 160. So let's start off here with the first question. What is the binomial nomenclature system? So bi is two nomial name, so the two name naming system. Um, and so that's the way we write scientific names. So it's the two name naming system for scientific names. And how are species names written? Well, the first name is the genus. And the second name, uh, that's that like descriptive name. We call that the specific epithet. This is just the fancy way to say that it is the descriptive name. And um, do you remember the rules? So what do we need to do if we are handwriting the name? So if it is handwritten, it needs to be underlined. And if it's typed, it needs to be in italics. Oh, darn. There we go. <laughs> um, and then, like an example of that, we could do the wolf, right? That would be a canis lupus. And what do we need to do? So, um, first name needs to be capitalized. That's happened there. Second name, lowercase. So, I guess we could say first name, genus, and capitalize. Even from video, I will still add things in, right? So we got that right. First name capitalized, second name lowercase. And then since it's typed, it needs to be in italics. But if you're handwriting it on like a copy of the paper, then you need to underline it instead. All right, number two. Um, rank the following from most inclusive to least inclusive. So most inclusive is like the biggest group. So what is our biggest group? Uh, domain and then what's next we have super group whoops super group and then kingdom and then phylum and then class so let's see we've got domain super group kingdom phylum class family is six and oops, actually it goes order, order before family. So order is six, and then family, and then genus, and species. So domain, supergroup, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. There we go. So you might need to use a uh, mnemonic device for that to help you remember the order of that. That is a pretty solid question to ask on the exam. Number three, what is the term for a process whereby organisms not closely related independently evolve similar traits as a result of living in similar environments. Um, so that is convert, oops, convergent evolution. Um, number four, which of the following is the term for an analogy on the molecular level? Um, so remember analogous structures are structures that um, don't share common ancestry. So that is a molecular homoplasy, which is um, you know, I didn't name it, but, the <laughs> but that's what the answer for four is. Um, I can't circle because I'm using Word and my mouse is already being a little bit funny if you can see it kind of just shaking around there. So, um, it's pretty particular. But anyhow, I can't circle them, but let's see which ones are the correctly highlighted clades. So, um, the first one is not a clade because that group on the uh, right hand side there is not part of a clade. Second one, 
not a clade because we left out um, these groups of, or these taxa on the left hand side and the taxa on the right hand side. The third one is a clade and the fourth one is a clade. So the third picture and fourth picture are correctly highlighted clades. So then we've got use the pictured phylogenetic tree to answer questions 6 through 11. I'm going to oh, scoot the tree up. Okay, so who has fins? Well, according to this image, um, sharks have fins. Are they the only one though? Who else has fins? Again, according to this image down here, it says the dolphin has fins as well. So shark and dolphin. I know I love a good select all that apply. Um, for garter snakes and crows, so here we have a garter snake, here we have a crow. For garter snakes and crows, having jaws, is that a shared derived character or a shared ancestral character? Well, where did jaws develop? Down here. So that's an older characteristic, so that's a shared ancestral character. And then again, for garter snakes and crows, is having uh, keratinous scales, is that a derived character or an ancestral character? Well, that's down here, so that's a newer characteristic, so that is a derived character. Oh my gosh, this mouse is terrible, guys, okay. Uh, draw a box around a three organism clade. Well, that's, I'm not going to be able to draw a box successfully, probably, but a three organism clade, um, we've got garter snake, crow, dolphin. That would be a three organism clade because we have the ancestor and all of the des descendants there. So garter snake, crow, and dolphin. A paraphyletic group. Well, that, we could have a lot of paraphyletic groups, um, but if we did like frog, garter snake, crow, and left out dolphin, that would be para paraphyletic. Or if we did like lamprey, shark, frog, that would be a paraphyletic group, right? Do you see how um, we have the we have the ancestor, but not all of the descendants in a paraphyletic group? So I'm gonna put down frog garter snake, garter snake, and crow. Um, and who's the outgroup on this one? Remember the outgroup is like the basal taxon, um, so they're the one with the least derived characteristics. So for us over here, the lamprey is the outgroup. That's that uh, jawless fish with all the teeth, kind of scary looking critter. Um, number 12 then, according to the principle of maximum parsimony, um, phylogenies based in DNA require the most base changes. Uh, B, the preferred tree is the one that minimizes the amount of evolutionary change. C, in the case of trees based on morphology, a parsimonious tree requires the most changes. Or D, a large number of trees should be examined. Remember, um, the principle of maximum parsimony is that... Um, the simplest answer is the best answer. So <laughs> this mouse is totally drifting. Um, but so the answer for this one is going to be that the preferred tree is the one that minimizes the amount of evolutionary change. So it should be that one. I'm going to pause for a second and see if I can fix this mouse. All right, I got my mouse fixed. We're back on track. So number 13, a molecular clock relies on the assumption that molecules are stable for long times. Mutations in DNA accumulate at roughly a constant rate. Matings are random in this population. Prokaryotes are more easily classified than eukaryotes or derived characters have arisen recently. Well, what's the only one, well, two talk about time right? So molecules are stable for long times and mutations accumulate in DNA at roughly a constant rate. Well, what's the only thing talking about time and rates and all of that? B. So B is our best answer for molecular clock. Um, 14. How does horizontal gene transfer complicate the understanding of the tree of life? Um, what is horizontal gene transfer? So horizontal gene transfer is the 
uh, transfer of DNA between genomes. So it doesn't even have to be closely related species. So um, when we try and understand the tree of life, like we're looking, we're trying to determine like evolutionary history of different organisms. But if an organism is getting DNA from an organism it's not closely related to, that kind of muddies the waters here. So we could say um, horizontal gene transfer transfer is transfer of genetic material um, between genomes, um, not necessarily whew, not necessarily um, from parents well, not necessarily from closely related species, and it's not from parents to offspring. So this makes tracking traits really difficult. All right. Hmm, 15. In the table below, place a D by the terms that are domains and EK by terms that are eukaryotic kingdoms. Next, provide a brief description. So bacteria, is that a domain or eukaryotic kingdom? That's a domain. How many domains are there? Three. Why don't we find all the domains first? So we had bacteria. Who else is a domain? There's two prokaryotic domains. Bacteria is one of them. What's the other prokaryotic domain? Yep, archaea. And then, I mean, if we're using all of our information on the test, it says eukaryotic kingdom for eukaryotic kingdoms. So our third domain is eukarya. So we'll go ahead and fill that in. So bacteria, what are some descriptions about bacteria? Well, they are prokaryotic. and single cell and do they have a cell wall yes what's that cell wall made up of mostly so it's made of peptidoglycan um spelling still hard so peptidoglycan um they have all kinds of nutrition, like they could be heterotrophic, they could be autotrophic, they could be parasitic, they could be free living. Uh, it just kind of depends there. So those are some good characteristics for bacteria. Okay, so then animals. Well, we already did our domain, so that means animals are a eukaryotic kingdom. And then what makes an animal an animal? So they are eukaryotic, obviously. Um, how many cells in an animal? Well, like the exact number doesn't matter, but do they have more than one? Yes. So they're multicellular. Do they have a cell wall? No. Um, and then... How do animals get their nutrients? They have to eat food. So what's the word for that? They are hetero, heterotrophic um, plants. They are a eukaryotic kingdom. So they are eukaryotic. How many cells in a plant? One or many? Many, so multicellular. Uh, do they have a cell wall? Yes, so cell wall, what's it made of? Cellulose. Cellulose. And how do they get their nutrition? They're photosynthetic for the most part. Obviously there's like some exceptions, but they're photosynthetic, so they are photoautotrophic. Fungi, we already said, eukaryotic kingdom. 
and so that means they are eukaryotic. They are multicellular. Oh, are they all? No, they're not. Some are single-celled. Um, do they have a cell wall? Yes. What's it made of? Chitin, but like with a CH instead of a K. So C-H-I-T-I-N, chitin. And how do they get their food? They are heterotrophic and they usually do absorption for nu their nutrition. Heterotrophic. Archaea, they're a domain. Um, they are, remember, prokaryotic. How many cells? Single. Cell wall? Mm, sometimes. So if they have a cell wall, what's it made of? Typically some kind of protein base, not peptidioglycan. Um, and these have all modes of nutrition as well. What are they famous for? They are famous for living in extreme environments. Do they all live there? No, but they're famous for living in extreme environments, so they're famous for being extremophiles. Like extreme environments would be like um, a hot spring or a salty lake or um, someplace with a p high pH, low pH, high temperature, low temperature, those kinds of things. And then eukaryota, that's a domain. So eukaryotic organisms could be single celled or multi celled. And all modes of nutrition. And what really separates, um, what separates eukaryotic organisms from prokaryotic organisms? Have a nucleus. That's really the big one there. So that's that. We'll go on to the next one here. Um, What's the term for the catch-all grouping that describes eukaryotic organisms that are not animals, not plants, not fungi? We no longer consider this a kingdom because these organisms are not more closely related to each other than other organisms. So remember we kind of joked and said like, oh, that's like the kind of catch-all group or like, oh, we didn't know what else to call you. So we'll call you a protist. So remember, the, like this is a common mistake, but remember that protists are eukaryotic. It's common to get that confused, but we said it's eukaryotic group here. Um, chapter 21. So which of the following is an example of a population? Is it all of the plain zebra on Earth? All of the plain zebra in a particular area capable of breeding with each other? All of the plain zebra, mountain zebra, and gravy zebra on Earth? All of the plain zebra in a particular area and the resources living and non-living they rely on? So um, a population is a group of species in a particular area. Um, so B is our answer. Um, microevolution, so mm, microevolution, common confusion here is you think like, okay, micro is small, right? And that's right. This is evolution on a small scale though, um, not like microorganisms and their evolution. And when we say a small scale for evolution, we mean evolution at the population level. So number 19 then, the chance that a mutation will occur is independent of whether a new phenotype will benefit a population, true or false. So do mutations occur to meet the needs of a particular population? 
No, mutations don't occur to meet the needs of a population. So it says the chance that a mutation will occur is independent of whether a new phenotype will benefit a population. That's actually true, right? Because that statement saying it doesn't matter if it benefits or harms the population, the chance of the mutation occurring is totally separate from whether it's good for that population or bad for a population. So 19 is true, but 19 is a little awkwardly worded. Um, 20, which of the following is not a condition of the Hardy-Weinberg or Hardy-Weinberg principle? So we have no gene flow or isolation, no genetic drift, no mutations, random matings, or all of those are conditions of Hardy-Weinberg principle. Actually, that's kind of a mean question. All of them are conditions of the Hardy-Weinberg principle. I really like putting it like no, no, no. So what's another way we could say random meeting if we put a no in front of it? Random meeting is the same as no mate selection. We see that? So remember, those are all things that can lead to microevolution. So those are all mechanisms of um, evolution. So what's the last condition of the Hardy-Weinberg principle? Um, this one's maybe tricky because we have like, you know, several things, but we left one out. But what's the mechanism of evolution you normally think of if you think of a mechanism of evolution? Like evolution by blink. So natural selection. So um, Hardy-Weinberg principle is if we say all of these things occur, evolution doesn't happen. So it would be no selection or no natural selection. All right, number 22. According to the theory of natural selection, what would happen to a species of lizards when a new predator is introduced into the environment where the lizards live? Um, a, the lizards that already have physical traits needed to avoid the new predator would be more likely to survive and reproduce, and the ones that do not would be less likely to survive and reproduce. How's that sound? That sounds pretty good so far, right? Like, um, we'll highlight, oops, we'll highlight that one here. Um, B, lizards would try to develop new physical traits to avoid the new predator. Now, at first glance, that might be good, but can you, like, try to get new traits? Um, I'm not very tall, and um, I want to be able to utilize the top shelves in my cabinet. If I tried hard enough, could I get a longer arm and be able to reach those things in the top of my cabinet? No. Obviously, that's not as pressing as a predator, but like I've tried really hard and it has still not happened. Um, C, some of the lizards would try to develop new physical traits to avoid the new predator and the other lizards would die. Like, oh, those lazy lizards didn't try hard enough. No, that's not how this works at all. So C is also wrong. Um, D, because all lizards of the same species have the same physical traits, one lizard would not have an advantage over another lizard. They would all either survive or die. Do all of the members of the same species actually have the same physical traits? Like, if you look at a group of people, do they all look exactly the same? No, right? We have different strengths. We have different weaknesses. We have different physical traits. So that's why D is also a lie. So A is actually our best answer for 22. Um, 23, which of the examples below represents directional selection? So directional selection is selecting for one extreme. So A here is the example that shows um, directional selection. Do you remember the other types of selection? So in B, we're selecting um, against short tails and against long tails, so selecting for a moderate trait. So um, B is called stabilizing selection. And then C C, we're selecting against the middle, and we're selecting for both of the extremes. So C is actually going to be disruptive or diversifying selection. Um, 
Uh, 24, peahens do not have the same large feathers as peacocks. The brighter and more colorful feather patterns male peacocks have, the better their selective advantage. The females prefer, prefer the more elaborate patterns on their mates. This is an example of which of the following, this is a select all that apply. So um, sexual dimorphism, so dimorphism to morphism structure. So that is an example of sexual dimorphism. The pea hen looks a lot different than the peacock. They're kind of brownish. Um, and then gene drift, gene flow. Nope, let's get rid of those. I don't know where my, we'll just strike through button is. We'll just make them really small. How about that? Okay, so it's not gene drift, it's not gene flow. So then intra and intersexual selection. What does intra mean and what does inter mean? Intra is within and inter is between. Um, so intrasexual selection, that would be like male-male competition. And this example is intersexual selection. Oftentimes we describe that as a female choice. It's not always, but um, it can be. 25, engineers can design a limb on a robot that is very, that is much more versatile than those of any animal. Why are animal limbs not optimally arranged? Is it A, natural selection has not yet had sufficient time to make the optimal limb. B, natural selection is limited to modifying structures that were present in previous generations. Uh, C, too many genes, each with many alleles, are needed to produce a limb for natural selection to work well. Or D, because animals are diploid and reproduce sexually, natural selection str struggles to improve so so D, that's that's already made up. We can we can just get rid of that one right away. Um, our current understanding of evolution can't explain why animal limbs aren't optimal. That's just fill in for space. So on this one, remember natural selection can only work on um, existing mutations. So natural selection can only modify structures that were present in previous generations. All right, so uh, 26, how is macroevolution different from microevolution? So we said micro is small scale, macro is big scale. What would that be in the terms of evolution though? So big scale in terms of evolution is um, creating new species. So macroevolution is evolution that leads to speciation, which speciation is just the word for creation of new species. So macro evolution um, it separates gene pools and leads to speciation ooh so what is a species even right what is a species using the biological species concept so um, the biological species concept says that to be the same species, um, individuals need to be able to do what? They have to be able to breed and produce living, viable, or sorry, viable, fertile offspring. Living is the same as viable. So um, species need to be able to breed and produce viable, that means living, Fertile, that means they can have their own offspring. Um, so then we talked about those um, pre-zygotic and post-zygotic barriers to reproduction. Um, so what's a zygote again? A zygote is a fertilized egg. Do you remember that? So if something is pre-zygotic, that means it happens before the egg was fertilized, right? Pre is before, and what's post? After. So post-zygotic barriers happen after the zygote's formed. So behavioral isolation, what was that? That was like if you had to have a certain song or dance or some other kind of behavior um, in order to mate. So that has to happen before the zygote's form. So that is a pre-zygotic barrier. 
Uh, zygor zygo mortality. Well, the zygote was formed, but then the zygote is not very long lived. So that's going to be post zygotic. Habitat isolation. What's your habitat? That's where you live, right? So if you live in a pond and somebody else lives on the, I don't know, in a treetop, are you ever going to have your paths cross and mate? No. So that is going to be a prezygotic isolating mechanism. Um, hybrid sterility. Well, if we formed an interspecies hybrid, that means two species have mated and had offspring, but then that offspring is not fertile, they're sterile. So if there was offspring, is that pre or post zygotic? Has to be post zygotic, right? Because you got the offspring from the zygote. So that's post. Um, temporal, uh, <laughs> temporal isolation. <laughs> temporal is time, right? So this means different species are not reproductively active at the same time. It could like be times of day or it could be times of the year. So either way though, if they're not reproductively active at the same time, they're not going to mate. So they're not going to form a zygote. So that would be a prezygotic isolating mechanism. Gamete isolation. Um, what's a gamete? Sperm or egg, right? So um, this means that the gametes can't get together. Um, so if the gametes don't get together, do you get a zygote? No. So this is a prezygotic isolating mechanism. Um, mechanical isolation, this one is when like the reproductive parts of different species literally don't fit together or they could cause injury um, during mating, things like that. So the I think our example in our book was the damselfly. Um, so this would be before the zygote could form. So this would be prezygotic. And then F2 breakdown is also sometimes called hybrid breakdown. Because um, what's what's the F2 generation, right? You have the P generation, then you have the F1. That's the offspring of the P. So the first interspecies hybrid is able to produce the F2 generation, but that next generation is unhealthy. So we had one set of offspring and a second set of offspring. So that's got to be postzygotic. All right, so we'll scroll down here. Um, 29, you are studying two different species of salamanders, which are separated by a hot and dry valley, and fossil evidence indicates that these two species share a common ancestor. Um, based on this information, you could conclude that these two species evolved due to blank. So, okay, if you're a salamander, what kind of environment do you need to survive? You need like um, a lot of moisture because you're in an amphibian. So is a hot and dry valley a geographic barrier to a salamander? Absolutely. So if we look at these answers, um, there's only two kinds of speciation we talked about in class. The rest of these answers are all made up to fill up letters. So the two kinds of speciation we talked about were sympatric and allopatric. So we can get rid of B and C. Again, we'll just make it small and we can get rid of E, those are all lies. So sympatric and allopatric. Um, sympatric, no geographic barrier. And allopatric is a geographic barrier that separates uh, populations and then you get do different species. So hot dry valley, that's definitely a geographic barrier to a salamander. So the answer for 29 is uh, D, allopatric speciation. So 30, growler, bra <laughs> growler bears or pizzlies are a mix between a polar bear and a grizzly bear. This is an example of which of the following, uh, polyploidy, zoonotic species, interspecies hybrid, and trus-species hybrid, post-species hybrid. So, this is an interspecies hybrid between species hybrid. 
Um, everything else is made up. The closest wrong answer would probably be D, intra-species hybrid, but remember, intra is within, and if you were within the same species, it wouldn't be a hybrid at all. All right, so then 31, um, according to the biological definition of fitness, the fittest individual is not necessarily the strongest, fatness, fastest, or biggest. Um, that's correct, because with the biological definition, definition of fitness, what are we looking at? We're looking at the ability for um, the organisms to contribute um, their genetic material to the next generation. So um, I think a lot of times when we talk about like survival of the fittest, um, that's like kind of an excuse for people to be mean or rude to each other. But biologically speaking, fitness is kind of like a measure of reproductive success. It's um, a measure of the likelihood for your genotype to be in the genetic material and the subsequent generation. Uh, 32, true or false, individual organisms can evolve during a single lifespan. That's false. Um, what does evolve? Like a population evolves. Um, so it's not individuals that evolve, it's a population that evolves because it's a change in proportion of alleles from one generation to the next. Uh, 33, true or false, humans can't negatively impact ecosystems because species will just evolve what they need to survive. Uh, that's false, right? Do, go back to my reaching the top shelf in the kitchen. Like, if I could, I'd want to just reach that top shelf, right? Do we, like, the environmental conditions really don't trigger a species to, like, want to gain a particular trait um, or particular mutation. So we can't just choose, um, or at least naturally speaking, we can't just create traits that we need because we need them. Uh, 34, true or false, evolution is a theory that Charles Darwin developed and no one else has contributed to the understanding of the mechanisms of evolution before or after. Uh, that's false as well. And I think you know by now that I don't really do a lot of true-false questions on my exam, but those are kind of big common misconceptions about evolution, and so I really felt like it was necessary to cover those topics. Uh, 35, which term is another term for artificial selection? So artificial selection is uh, selective breeding. That's when um, people choose which organisms are going to um, reproduce. So like if you want a really fast racehorse, um, obviously this is oversimplification, but you breed a whole bunch of fast horses together and you get faster horses, right? You want a woolly sheep, you breed woollier sheep together and you get woolly sheep. You want a chicken that's great at laying eggs, breed more chickens that lay eggs. Uh, readily. You want a heavy chicken? Um, breed those, right? That's selective breeding. You can do it not just with animals, you can do it with crops as well, or plants, I suppose you could say. Um, 36, when a population is fished, many of the largest fish are removed, so more of the small-bodied fish and their small-bodied alleles remain. Could this lead to evolution? Explain. Um, yeah, if if fish body size is related to genetics, then removing the large bodied alleles could cause that population to be smaller. So if you remove large bodied, bodied alleles from the population, fish with small bodied alleles um, will survive and produce more fish with small bodied alleles or small body alleles. And what's evolution again? Evolution is just change in proportion of alleles from one generation to the next. Or change in proportion of alleles over time. That might be a better way to say that. 
it's not just between one generation, it's multiple generations as well. So 37. The emu is a species of large bird native to Australia. They have wings but do not fly. Since they don't use their wings for flight, some people argue that emu wings are which of these? If it's a structure that we don't actually use anymore, people might call it a vestigial structure. Um, 38. What is the term for the study of the distribution of species and ecosystems in geographic space? Geographic space. That is a biogeography. 39. This is like <laughs> a very weak definition for this, but what is the term uh, for preserved evidence of life from a past geological age? That's the fossil record. Um, how do most people use the word theory? Is this the same as the way scientists use the word? I would say probably not. Most people use the word theory like a guess, right? So that's not how scientists use the word theory. So most people use the word theory like, um, like an educated guess, maybe a hypothesis. Um, and scientists use uh, the word theory to mean the accepted explanation of a natural phenomenon. And so, like, sure, evolution is just a theory, meaning it is just the um, accepted explanation for how life changes over time. All right, so 20, chapter 23 stuff, uh, number 41. The oldest fossils, are they usually found above younger fossils? No. Um, they're found in sediments formed during the Cenozoic area? No. Uh, we didn't have to worry about memorizing the eras. Do they contain more radioactive isotopes than younger fossils? No. Are they found in the deepest strata? Yes. What strata? Layers. So older fossils are ten generally going to be deeper. They tend to be deeper. Um, continental drift. What is continental drift? Right? That's the movement of the bodies of, or not bodies of water, that's movements of land bodies, right? So um, continental drift um, could create uh, mountains, we could separate land masses. So which one is the type of speciation with a geographic barrier? Allopatric speciation. So continental drift is most likely to lead to allopatric speciation. Oh, I thought we made it, but we don't. We're almost done. We're going to make it. <laughs> 43. Um, there are at least 14 species of Hawaiian honeycreepers, and there were thought to be more than 50 species prior to Polynesian colonization. These birds have highly specialized beaks. For example, different species are adapted to eating seeds, insects, or nectar. If all of the honeycreeper species evolved from a single ancestral species, this would be an example of which of the following... So we have a handy picture of that showing um, the different um, species of honeycreepers there. But that is an adaptive radiation because we had a single ancestral species that kind of like blew up into a whole bunch of different species there. Um, why does evolution not lead to the development of perfect structures? Well, natural selection can only um, work on existing variation. So that's probably a good answer for that. Honestly, I would never ask a question this broad on an exam because who knows what we would get, right? Um, but probably the textbook answer for this is that um, natural selection can only work on existing variation. Um, and then also um, mutations don't occur to meet a species needs. So now we made it. Um, hopefully you found this helpful and if you made it to the end, great job.